Do you like to stand <laughs> still or do you like to? Stand? <laughs> <laughs> At least I never heard this. I think the voice is pretty much a little above. Okay. I've got that wide enough so you can move it. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I'm just copying straight from the desktop and just using it straight off the other there. Alright, there it is. There it is. And you can, uh, there's a clicker that you can turn on and you can either use it or you can use the arrow buttons completely up to you. Okay, is there a... There you go. I've got a pointer just in case. No, well, it doesn't show up on the TV. Oh, that's right. It only shows up on... So I have to pretty much do this. Yeah, that's what that's what I normally recommend. If, yeah. And plus, that way, people who are watching can see what you're doing. So in other words, if you're doing it here, people that are watching can't see the pointer anyway. Yeah. So that helps them too. So. Okay. No problem. Okay. Thank you. You're, welcome. you're very welcome. Excuse me.
Mm -hmm. Well, this is the next one. And Mark lost. Some were fun, some were worse. You did not that much. I'll wrap one up. Here we go. everybody again for coming. Today we have pharmacokinetics on the menu. Yay. As you know, my PhD is in pharmacokinetics, so it's one of my favorite topics. And we have the person on campus here that knows the ins and outs of PK is Ed Acosta. He's in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Uh, been here a long time and I won't go into any more detail than I don't that. I want to say how many years. <laughs> exactly. So uh, for the people that are listening in online, I'll check in the chat box later on if there's any questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, so for now, Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mike. I want to make sure that this works. Yep, it does. So as Mike mentioned, I've uh, um, 
I'm director of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology here in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Been here <clears throat> a lot more than 10 years, I would <laughs> <you> say <laughs> that. Um, and my uh, research focus has been uh, always uh, on primarily on uh, antivirals, antiretroviral drugs. We, my laboratory, uh, we have the uh, mass spec, mass spectrometers, um, we have five of them now, uh, that we focused on uh, drug uh, assay development for primarily for small molecules. Um, usually those are going to be uh, approved drugs or drugs that are uh, going through the pipeline and we do a lot of uh, pediatric work as well. So we figure out how to dose uh, a lot of these drugs in uh, from kids and babies and even premature babies. <clears throat> and so that's sort of where I'm coming from. Um, this, I'm also director of the Cancer Center's PKPD Core, and uh, we work on, I don't know, right now we have well over 40 individual projects, most of them small uh, projects, but helping other researchers in the Cancer Center and other places um, uh, develop assays for whatever compounds they're working on, uh, primarily in support of uh, their grant efforts. Uh, you'd be surprised, actually you probably wouldn't, but uh, how many uh, pink sheets come back, reviewers comments and say, well, what's the half life of your compound? Mm -hmm. Like, damn, <laughs> forgot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's where we would come in, we develop an assay method for the compound and uh, do at least some of the basic uh, preliminary uh, PK work and, and that's more preclinical side. Most of everything I do is on the clinical side when we're actually dealing with uh, with patients and humans. And so uh, what we're going to do is just kind of go through um, the importance, well, that's a relative <laughs> term on how important <laughs> pharmacokinetics is depending on who you might be. Uh, but for me anyway, and Mike, the importance of pharmacokinetics uh, during the drug development uh, process and, and what pharmacokinetics uh, is and what it does uh, for um, uh, for drug development, but obviously it can take quite a while for uh, for new drugs uh, to get approved. Uh, oftentimes it is a crapshoot. Um, you can have 5,000 more compounds screened. Uh, a small percentage of that actually answers preclinical testing, and then several may enter the clinical arena. Uh, first, uh, first time in human dosing, phase one, and then ultimately one might be approved by the FDA. Even if it is approved by the FDA, it doesn't mean that two, three, four, five years later, um, after the drug is approved and is in widespread use, uh, issues can come up with it. Um, Vioxx would be a good example, and uh, the drug is subsequently removed from the market. So they, they put a, a tremendous amount of effort and, and finances into uh, uh, of getting one compound approved, but that's still no guarantee that it's going to stay approved. Um, we typically work, uh, again, we do some preclinical, uh, mostly animal type work. We don't deal with the animals, we deal with other researchers that, um, that have the animals. But we typically work more in phase one and or phase two. Um, and we also uh, uh, do some stuff in, in phase three, but uh, those are going to be typically a much larger uh, clinical trials that uh, individual companies are probably going to be focusing on, uh, on themselves. In our pediatric work, um, we do a lot of the phase one where a drug has just been approved uh, in adults greater than 18, for example, and because of the clinical arena, um, in my case HIV, obviously there's a need for these drugs in pediatrics as well. And so usually around the beginning or middle of phase three, uh, they'll appro approach a group like mine or, or the network I, I work with and say, we need to get this drug or look at this in, in pediatrics and then we'll uh, design the trials and, and begin to move forward. Um, so typically I'm, I'm working in the phase one or phase two arena. Uh, a lot of different studies uh, have to be done, obviously, uh, for, uh, for the, during the approval uh, process. Phase one is critical. That's why the single ascending dose and, and, and phase two primarily is a multiple ascending dose. Uh, pharmacokinetic studies are done. Formulations are looked at. One of the drugs we work with, they had four or five different formulations all at the same time and didn't know which one to move forward with. The 
they ultimately had to pick one, and then they ultimately had went back and used a different one for something else, and it, it gets really confusing. Um, food effects, relative bioavailability between different formulations, and of course, uh, drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, and, uh, and excretion. Um, <clears throat> phase two is typically going to be more of the dose finding. Back in phase one, one of the reasons they do the primary reason they do the single ascending dose studies is to look at not just the pharmacokinetics and not just the safety, but does that drug uh, demonstrate linear pharmacokinetics? So, for example, if you give a 100 milligram dose and get an AUC of 20, if you give a 200 milligram dose, is the AUC now about 40? That would be linear pharmacokinetics. If at some point in the, the single ascending dose, uh, the AUC starts to increase considerably more uh, than what the dose increases, that's a, a approaching a point of nonlinearity, uh, enzyme saturation, or whatever it might be causing it. And uh, generally, that's an area uh, of pharmacokinetics they want to avoid uh, because now you can't predict what your drug concentrations are going to be once you, if you reach that stage. So uh, most of the drugs uh, clearly are going to uh, exhibit um, the linear pharmacokinetics and moving into and then move into the phase two, which is more of the dose finding, where the number of doses looked at are shrunk down. Uh, there's not as many, and uh, a multiple uh, ascending dose and a dose finding uh, study is is conducted. If they do it, and again, this is just my opinion, but if they do it appropriately. Phase two is where they'll find the concentration response relationships or the pharmacodynamics uh, of the drug. So you give X doses at, at a, a, using a wide uh, range of doses. I like to use at least 20 times. Um, I have a really good example at the end that I'll show you of a drug that was done uh, exceptionally well, uh, in my opinion. But by using a wide range of doses, you get a wide range of concentrations and thus a wide range of responses and or toxicities depending on what you might be looking at. That information is critical uh, moving forward uh, into phase three to choose the dose. For me, I don't care about a drug's dose. It doesn't matter. It's the concentration of the drug in the body that actually matters. You can always go back and figure out what dose you need to produce that concentration. Yeah. And so dose finding studies to me is kind of a misnomer. It's concentration finding studies. What concentration produces the best response. Um, obviously from there other studies need to be done. Drug-drug interaction studies, cardiovascular testing, um, and then moving into phase three. Oftentimes the phase three trials will have um, uh, more than one dose going into it. Uh, so one of the studies I saw, I think they used 400 milligrams uh, and then used 600 milligrams and after 24 weeks or some period of time, they looked at the data and saw that they were both equivalent. So everybody in the 600 moved to the 400 and they continued on with the 400 dose. And uh, so oftentimes if they're unsure what the dose might need to be uh, for phase three, they can uh, open it, open it or design a trial with different doses to, uh, uh, to move forward. And then obviously phase four is when you get in and start, start to looking at um, uh, special populations, uh, whether that's pediatrics or, uh, or during pregnancy or, or whatever it might be, and it's the post-marketing uh, approval phase um, where the commitments uh, from the FDA uh, need to be uh, upheld. There's a really good example of this is with um, two hepatitis C drugs that first came out a number of years ago. Neither was a very good drug, mm -hmm. but um, it was it was a good option uh, for uh, treat, treatment of, of HCV at that time. Mm -hmm. One company, they both got approved on the exact same day by the FDA. One company beforehand, both drugs were uh, significant, uh, significantly utilized CYP384 metabolic pathway. And so they're prone to multiple drug drug interactions. And the drugs obviously would be used with other drugs, especially HIV drugs, and there's a ton of different interactions there. So one company went ahead and performed all of these different types of uh, uh, drug drug interactions earlier in phase two and phase three prior to submitting the NDA for approval. The other company did not. And so they both got approved on the same day, pretty similar drugs. Um, the company that did not do the studies had this laundry list of phase four uh, post-approval commitments of studies that they had to do. Uh, the other company had already done them. 
So guess what happened? The company that had already done them uh, quickly took about 75% of the market mm -hmm. uh, because people knew how to use the drug. So they used it you know, a lot more often. So those types of uh, uh, studies need to be done, uh, designed in phase three, uh, auction times completed in phase four um, to determine the best way to use, uh, use the drug. Some of the pharmacokinetic causes of drug failure, um, poor bioavailability, huge problem. Um, whatever the uh, oral uh, dose or dose formulation is, uh, is critical oftentimes for, for a lot of the compounds. But poor bioavailability due to uh, low solubility and or high first pass metabolism. One of the HIV drugs from the, I don't want to date myself, but I'll just say the second half of the 90s. Um, as my kids say, way back in the 19s. <laughs> like, come on. It's like, what, this 1800 or something? And uh, um, the, the drug, it was a very effective drug, but had its bioavailability of the first formulation that came out was 4%. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's pretty low. Yeah. Um, they ultimately changed uh, the formulation a little bit, significantly increased it to about 12%. Um, but uh, so bioavailability can be a can be a, a big issue for that drug. It was actually a very very high first pass metabolism. Uh, inadequate duration uh, of action. I've done a lot of work with uh, researchers here and other places in preclinical, and they're all excited about this compound that they're working on or whatever it might be. And they get their comments back from submitting R1, R21, or something like that. It says, hey, you, know, you got to look at the kinetics. And so we look at the kinetics, and it has a half-life of about 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this may not be something you want to put a lot of time and effort into um, if it has that fast and a half-life. Uh, not always, but, but, but in general. And then there's also unanticipated drug interactions, um, which are going to be more uh, often revealed in, in phase two and particularly phase three. Um, they have... Uh, highly variable pharmacokinetics. Uh, I don't think I included that slide. I should have put it in there. But um, generally, you see a concentration time curve, and there's one line, and maybe standard standard error bars or something at each of the time points. Uh, that could be a significant understatement as to what the true variability is uh, of a drug uh, in, the, in the average population. And there's a lot of reasons why that uh, variability exists. Um, and then, of course, undesirable effects on the uh, efficacy or safety. So some of the reasons for attrition for drugs uh, during the, uh, the 19s, last <laughs> decade, um, uh, obviously there's a, there's a lot of different reasons, but one of the most uh, uh, cited reasons was uh, for uh, pharmacokinetics and or uh, bioavailability. I think over time uh, since then, uh, this has probably changed a bit. Because many oftentimes um, it's it's easier to know the, the technologies today um, if a drug has poor pharmacokinetics or poor bio, bio, bioavailability. Number one, can it be fixed? And if it can't, let's just stop the product now and move on to something different. As opposed to before, they keep pushing and pushing. We can get this. We can do it. We can make it work. And they can't. At the end. So pharmacokinetics, the time course of the drug in humans, uh, simplistically, it's simply what the body does to the drug. Pharmacodynamics is the relationship between the concentration of the drug in the body and the measured effect, or what the drug does to the body. And uh, <clears throat> this, is, so this is where the PK and, and, and PD uh, come into play. And so a lot of what I'm talking about, especially I emphasize a lot, the, concentration response relationships and pharmacodynamics. Obviously, to do that, you need a good biomarker of response or a biomarker of toxicity. But the biomarker of response is uh, uh, it's critical. And so in the fields I work in, we can measure viral loads. The patient comes in and do a blood drop and measure how much a virus is circulating in the system. Um, once they start drug therapy, good drug therapy, that virus the amount of virus goes down. And so that's what we like to um, try and compare. It, it, it's the concentrations of the drug with that change, in this case, with the amount of virus in the body over time. In other states, uh, oncology, for example, um, 
uh, there probably aren't the best biomarkers yet available, but there are some, especially for solid tumors, if um, imaging can show shrinkage of a tumor. So here's the drug, here's the concentration, here's how much it, uh, it changes over time to shrink as it grow. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's plenty of room in the uh, uh, oncology field to start applying some of this uh, concentration time data uh, establishing pharmacodynamics to determine what the dose should be in the first place instead of simply dosing to the MTD and saying, okay, three people got sick, so now we back off and that's our dose. No, it's not. You, you don't know that that's your dose. It's the dose that didn't make those three people sick because um, you backed off, but it doesn't necessarily define a concentration response relationship. So I kind of harp on that a little bit. but. Um, I come at it from a slightly uh, slightly different perspective. So why are the, the kinetics important? Every single drug out there has a therapeutic window. Every single one, in my opinion. It's just a matter of finding it and defining what that window is. Uh, obviously, if the concentrations go too high, we can, uh, we're can we concerned about toxicity. If the concentrations are too low, we're poor efficacy or in my case, development of resistance uh, to the virus or uh, antibiotics, whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, but there's some window, um, some zone in the middle where uh, we want the concentrations to be. It may not be all of the concentrations, so an entire concentration time curve. In the case of some of the, the drugs we work, it's, it's just the trough concentration. Uh, we need that to be above certain susceptibility of the virus that's being treated. And so we, we focus a lot on, on what that trough concentration is, which is the lowest concentration at the end of the dosing interval um, just prior to the next dose. And so all of the concentrations don't have to be in the window, uh, but the ones that matter from a clinical or toxicity perspective uh, uh, need to be. It's just luckily, I think, for us, a lot of the drugs uh, Clearly not in all disease states, but this window is really, really, really big. I mean, third generation cephalus quarantine with grams of people or not, because um, they, they have a very safety, a wide safety margin. And so that's a, that's a good thing that's been happening over the years. But every drug does have a window. It just may be really big. Um, so absorption is movement of the drugs uh, across the biological barriers from the site of administration to the bloodstream. Obviously, there's multiple routes of administration, uh, oral, peripheral, IV, sub-Q, IM, <clears throat> inhalation, uh, rectal, topical, transdermal. Uh, we're working on a project um, with a drug that's a, it's actually a very large drug, a uh, large molecule for uh, treatment of HIV uh, using a transdermal approach with a, a small company and that's developing that. And uh, so it's really kind of a cool process of uh, uh, following that as, as we go. And then bioavailability is simply the fraction of the drug that reaches the systemic circulation. It does not dictate and it is not the, uh, the rate of drug absorption. That's completely different. This is just how much of what you put in your mouth gets into the systemic circulation. And that's what uh, that's what bioavailability is. And I just like this cartoon. I just always thought it was funny. So I'll keep that in there. Uh, first pass metabolism, uh, the blood supply of the upper GI tract uh, uh, goes through the liver before reaching the systemic circulation and the drugs may be uh, metabolized by the gut wall uh, and the liver. This drug I mentioned before is a, a strong 3A4 substrate, very low bioavailability. A lot of it was actually metabolized in the gut uh, and then it hit the liver. More of it went away. By the time it hit the circulation, there was only 4% of it left. Um, and so this uh, this can be a, can be an issue. We we ultimately uh, this some of this pathway can be blocked uh, with other drugs. So we have another drug available. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, it's called Ritonavir. It's a, probably to me anyway probably the most potent cytochrome P four fifty three four inhibitor known to humankind. Uh, it's very, very potent in that inhibiting uh, 3A4 uh, clinically. But so as an example, this drug, which was sequinavir is its name, it had, you know, 10, 5, 10% bioavailability 
when a little bit of this ritonavir was added concomitantly with the sequinavir, the sequinavir AUC increased by 28 times. <laughs> so needless to say, they went forward and studied that, mm -hmm. and then that combination actually became pretty popular and pretty common uh, for a while because the concentrations now were, and it was, it's a safe drug, an effective drug, um, but the concentrations were so much higher, uh, they could actually dose it twice a day and oftentimes once a day because of this three, it's potent 3A4 inhibition. So drug interactions aren't always bad. Sometimes they can be used for, for good purposes, and, and we've actually done quite a bit of that, I think, uh, as a group in the uh, HIV field. Um, the pH and, and drug absorption is also a, a very critical that I think a lot of people probably overlook how important this is. <clears throat> Um, including me, I, I do it myself all the time. But so for acidic drugs, uh, uh, an acidic uh, a PKA, as the pH decreases, the amount of the ionized drug decreases, meaning unionized is higher and gets absorbed better. Mm -hmm. So I always think of these as like likes like. So if you have an acidic drug, it's going to like an acidic environment. Mm -hmm. A basic drug likes a basic environment. It will be absorbed better. Yeah. So, I, yeah, we think that when you come by this basic patients, so can you predict that PK or PD will still be based on chemical structure of a drug? And you can work with a chemist, medicinal chemist. I can't. <laughs> um, there may be some people a lot smarter than me that can do it. You have to test. Yes. As far as I know, it really does need to be looked at. And then it depends on what model system you look at it in. Um, mice and rats are, and cell lines are very different than people. And so it can change completely. You may have a three-minute half-life in, in a certain mouse model, but it turns out to be 24 hours in people. I mean, it just it, it completely depends. But this is um, this is really important because there was a there's another drug that um, it's been around for quite a while for, for HIV, but it, um, I forgot which one it was, um, but when it's taken orally, if the uh, gut pH went above 4, so basically taking it with an antacids or proton pump inhibitors or something like that, um, the, the absorption decreased by a greater than 90 percent. Mm. But if it's less than four, 3.8, mm -hmm. you got pretty much full absorption. And they actually did this with, with healthy volunteers. They went in and sampled the gut pH. And so they could clearly show that, you know, at XY pH, this is how much drug uh, uh, got into the system. And so, um, so for a lot of the drugs, you just probably don't think of that, but when you know, clinically say, well, don't take this drug with antacids or don't take it with proton pump inhibitors or um, you have to you have to eat a Big Mac, you know, mm -hmm. when you take this pill or something like that. There's usually a good reason behind that and that will, because uh, it significantly, it can significantly affect how much drug actually gets absorbed. And again, for it, it's going to depend on the disease state, but most disease states require a certain amount of concentration of drug to be circulating in the system to be efficacious. So distribution, um, it's reversible transfer of drug from one location to another within the body. This is really the, so after the drug is, is ingested, it becomes distributed throughout the body. Each drug is going to be different in terms of where it goes. Some might go to the heart, the lungs, or the muscle, or fat, or the brain, the bones. Um, it's going to be different for, for, for each drug. Um, but the, um, uh, the permeability uh, will be determined by the specifics, the physicochemical properties of that particular compound. So water-soluble, um, generally blood and interstitial space, versus fat-soluble uh, tissues. Um, and drugs which, which pass into the uh, blood-brain barrier uh, and into CNS are typically small and, and, and higher lipid filling. Um, so we distribution volume is, is a, a concept that we have to uh, consider because when we measure drugs in plasma or serum or whatever it is, it's always an amount per volume, milligrams per liter, nanograms per mil, micrograms per mil, whatever it might be. 
and uh, <clears throat> that volume is the is is, is critical uh, to that. So again, I'll pick on that same drug, sequinavir again, but it had very uh, poor bioavailability. Um, <clears throat> it also had a distribution volume of well over 300 liters. So it's an apparent distribution volume. <laughs> it's not a real volume. Um, so even someone like me doesn't have 300 liters of volume uh, in it. But, uh, but it, just, it, it just sort of shows that the drug was uh, uh, really circulated, got to a lot of different places, um, and had a, a, a very a large distribution volume as a result. Uh, protein binding is also, at least in our field, a, a, a very, very important factor um, that at first wasn't really taken into consideration um, because only the free drug is the active drug. Bound drug does not work. And so there's a couple of factors that really do determine the degree of protein binding. One is the affinity uh, of the drug for the particular plasma protein. In general, it's going to be albumin. Um, the drugs I work with, it's, it's primarily uh, AAG or alpha-1 acid lipoprotein uh, that they bind to, and then the number of binding sites available. And drugs can do compete with other drugs and, and other products uh, for these binding sites. So it's not very common at all, but you can get protein binding drug-drug interactions, where one drug displaces another drug off of protein binding sites, so the free concentration of the other drug now goes really high or changes. Um, and again, so that's a drug that has a narrow therapeutic window, that could be very clinically significant. Luckily, that doesn't really happen very often. <clears throat> again, so distribution volume, that's the volume that would be required in the body to contain the administered dose if that dose was evenly distributed at the concentration measured uh, in the plasma. Again, so we call it, a, for oral, oral therapy anyway, a, an apparent distribution volume uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's not it can be a lot larger than a typical human. <laughs> um, but so we consider low distribution volume drugs generally in the three to five liter range. Uh, they primarily distribute uh, in plasma. Um, medium, uh, 12 to 14 or so, uh, which distributes in uh, plasma and also extracellular space. And then high distribution volume drugs, uh, greater than 42 liters. Um, and these aren't hard, fast numbers by any stretch, uh, but these distribute uh, also in the tissues, whether it's fat, muscle, brain, whatever it might be. Um, so we have to consider the, you know, the distribution volume of the drug when we're uh, doing pharmacokinetic uh, determinations. So elimination of the drug, uh, obviously there's uh, multiple ways that drugs are eliminated uh, from the body, metabolized, excreted. Uh, metabolites excreted, excreted unchanged, whatever it may be, but it's irreversible loss of the drug from the site uh, of measurement. The whole purpose, again, I'm sure this has been beaten in everyone's head over the years, I hope, but the whole purpose of metabolism is uh, to convert uh, one chemical species to another to make it more polar so it can be readily eliminated. Um, and excretion, then, is the loss of the, the chemically uh, unchanged drug, unless, of course, it's a metabolite. So 3A4 is, uh, uh, or cytochrome P450 in particular, is, is clearly the um, uh, enzyme responsible for, for the vast majority of uh, drugs that are metabolized uh, hepatically. Uh, and then uh, there's also obviously renal excretion and some of the other uh, isozymes uh, as well that, that are important. So metabolism. Um, Again, these the enzymes involved in metabolism are they're present in many tissues, like the gut, for example, uh, as well as other places, uh, can produce, can produce uh, an active uh, or inactive metabolites. And again, the goal is to produce more polar compound that can be really uh, eliminated. And drug metabolism rates uh, do vary a lot uh, among patients. And there's a whole host of reasons why, but genetic factors uh, can be one. Um, Coexisting uh, uh, disorders and drug-drug uh, interactions, obviously, that can, uh, that can affect the concentrations of the drug. And also in, in, in babies, uh, clear little children, babies, infants, neonates, completely different world when it comes to the pharmacokinetics. Mm -hmm. So one of the drugs we've been working with um, in, I'm trying to remember the ages, but I think four weeks, 
at four, it, it has approval now from the FDA at four weeks uh, of age um, for six milligrams per kilo twice a day. And it's a very, very safe drug. Uh, it's very effective, very well tolerated. So everybody involved decided we need to figure out how do we dose this drug in a brand new baby where we don't know if that baby has HIV yet, but the mom does. And the mom's been treated, so the chances of the baby having HIV are pretty are, are low, two percent or something like that. Um, but you don't know for sure. So, what drugs can we use in the baby now to prevent uh, that baby from developing the infection? So, we took this drug and uh, did uh, a lot of modeling and simulation work to try to figure out what that dose should be or could be, and started looking at. It. Uh, uh, in patients, these are mostly uh, international uh, clinical sites where where this is enrolled. Um, but this dose from four weeks of age, it was six milligrams per kilo twice a day. The dose we're settling on for the newborn within 48 hours of birth is one milligram per kilo uh, once a day. So we're mm -hmm. one milligram per kilo once a day to six per kilo twice a day in four weeks. Mm -hmm. So it is changing really, really rapidly. And so we've had to sort of sort all of that out uh, as we're as we're going tra going through to try to figure out when should the dose change. Mm -hmm. and when it does change, what do we change it to? Mm -hmm. So the, the metabolism uh, in this drug is more of a UGT1A1 uh, metabolized drug. Uh, so luckily we don't have to worry too much about significant uh, interactions. But phase one, uh, again, is the uh, cytochrome P450 system, the microsomal uh, superfamily. Obviously, there's a, a number of different uh, families within this group, and these enzymes, as you know, can be induced or inhibited uh, by other drugs and, uh, and other substances. Um, most drugs, as I mentioned, are metabol that are metabolized are metabolized by CYP3A4. Um, some of these drugs can induce or speed up uh, uh, the metabolism. Good example of that that many of you are probably aware of is rifampin, the um, uh, drug commonly used for tuberculosis infection. Anything else going through the 3A4 pathway just gets eaten up. And uh, oftentimes there's actually a contraindication. So if somebody is using this drug and you have to use rifampin, you cannot use them together because rifampin will just eat up the other drugs. So you need to stop this drug therapy first for TB treatment and uh, finish that and then restart the therapy. Efavirenz is another one that's a drug that we use uh, it's used very, very often in for HIV therapies. Also very, very uh, uh, potent inducer of cytochrome E450, uh, 3A4. And then other drugs slow it down. This is the example of the that I mentioned earlier. Pretty much shuts it off. Um, there's still metabolism that occurs, but uh, really, really slows down metabolism of drugs going through that pathway. And again, in some cases we can use this as, as an advantage. Um, in, um, I know the gut system works, but in the American system, is there uh, somebody that tracks like, okay, patient X is already on this drug, so when we add drug B, we need to be on the lookout for that? Is that kind of the task of the physician? Or, or no, there, there are... Um, Oftentimes, uh, pharmacies have access to databases. So even just entering the drug in for a particular patient, it'll okay. send up red flags. Okay. Say, all right, this is going to interact with this, but you as an individual have to evaluate how bad this might be. Yeah. Um, there are also other databases, uh, particularly for the HIV drugs, that, um, that are kept. Uh, one of the big, a good one is, is in Europe. Uh, where you can go in and put in whatever drugs you want, mm -hmm. and it will spit up, you know, what what the interaction is. If there's data, if there's not data, and suggestions mm -hmm. on what to do, uh, even if there's not data. So, uh, so yeah, those do exist. Okay. There's definite ways to do that, um, or they email someone like me. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, dealing with one of those this morning. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Um, uh, and we can you know, just give our opinions on what, on what to try. And if we really don't know, my lab also does um, a lot of uh, 
uh, TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring. So in, in specific um, clinical, very interesting clinical cases. Um, every now and then I'll, someone will contact me and say, hey, you know, I have this and this going on with these drugs. Don't know what to do about it. And I go, I don't really know what to do about it either. And so they'll draw a sample or two or, or whatever from the patient, process it, and ship me the plasma. And we'll actually run the assay and get the concentrations back and get back to them and say, okay, this, this should be okay or whoa. <laughs> um, and so, so we actually do some of that uh, as well. So that would be more of the, the real-time therapeutic drug monitoring to assess what's really going on. Um, obviously, phase two won't spend a lot of time on this, but with uh, urinidation, sulfation, acetylation, um, again, the point being to uh, uh, create more polar uh, metabolites that can then be uh, really eliminated. And excretion, elimination of the unchanged, uh, which means not changed by the liver um, from the body. Drugs can obviously be eliminated from multiple, uh, multiple ways. Kidneys is the primary. Lungs. 5-FU, breathe it out. Um, we've done some, done some work on that as well. Uh, saliva, uh, sweat, breast milk. One of the things we're actually looking at, which is uh, pretty interesting, but one of the problems with HIV therapeutics is adherence. Somebody has to take the drugs for the rest of their lives. Um, and you get burned out doing that. And so oftentimes people stop taking their drugs well our load comes back up, they could become resistant, and then it's a, it has to be dealt with. Um, one of the things that they're looking at now is, uh, is actually hair. So you and I probably wouldn't be good candidates <laughs> for that, but um, actually uh, cutting off, pulling out whatever strands of hair. You have beard hair now. I, no, one, no one's pulling this out. That hurts. <laughs> you could pull this out. I don't care. Not this. Um, and, uh, uh, and actually uh, quantitating the drugs hair. And it's a, a marker uh, of long-term adherence. So the hair concentrations don't go up and come down like a typical drug in the plasma would do. They just kind of go up over time and stay there. And if somebody's not taking their drugs, they're going to be lower. If they're taking their drugs, they're going to be higher. And you, so, you then get a time scale over the length of hair. Well, that's a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. So is... Uh, I'm not quite sure how well standardized the process is at this point um, because they do require a certain length and, um, and then they'll use uh, a certain portion of it only. So the, the end part isn't very good. The root part is going to reflect more of what's going on uh, immediately. But there's a little sweet spot in between somewhere or they'll take those pieces and um, I, I don't know exactly what to do. We haven't done it, so I don't know. Um, but extract the drug out of it and actually measure uh, the mass spec. So from, from a long-term adherence uh, perspective, it's probably a lot easier um, than having somebody come in and have a blood draw. Mm -hmm. Say, well, you're fine. Okay, and they, they go home and don't take their doses for another three months. Yeah. Um, see that uh, all too often. Uh, Enterohepatic circulation can also occur. Uh, there's only a couple of drugs that I know of anyway that really undergo that. But the, the renal excretion uh, of the drugs is also important. Um, primarily filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Um, so I think the, the important point here is probably this slide where if the renal clearance is about 120 or so ish, probably the drug's likely undergoing only a glomerular filtration. If it's less than that, it's also undergoing fil um, filtration, but also tubular reabsorption. So that would be uh, here where, uh, let me see, where the drug is coming from the, uh, the, the Bowman's capsule area back into the circulation, um, uh, into systemic circulation. And then also, um, and then if it's much higher than 120, um, those per minute is filtration and tubular secretion. So filtration is occurring, the drug is also being secreted directly um, you know, from the blood into the, uh, into the renal tubules. And <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, um, 
for, for a lot of the drugs during the development process. This is looked at very closely to determine, um, you know, is, is it filtration only or is it a combination of these? The reason that's important is um, drugs can also interact at the level of the kidney. Probenicid is a good example that can inhibit tubular reabsorption. Um, and so, and there's other drugs that can do that as well. So if a drug is primarily, is eliminated by filtration and reabsorption, and now you have a drug blocking reabsorption, you can significantly increase the concentrations um, of the one that's being, uh, being filtered. So um, this is important information from the uh, determining drug uh, development and dose determination uh, as well. Clearance of the drug is a measure of the ability of the body to eliminate it. It is not an indicator of how much drug is removed, but it's the volume of plasma cleared of drug in a given period of time. That's why it's always expressed as volume uh, per unit time, mils per minute or liters per hour. I usually use liters per hour. Um, and half-life, uh, I'm sure all of you know this, but it's the, the time for the plasma concentration to reduce, be reduced by 50% or half. Um, so five half-lives is uh, after starting the drug um, is required uh, to reach steady state and it's also required for the drug to be eliminated from the body. So if you have a drug with a 24-hour half-life, it's going to take five days of dosing before you reach steady state or five days after for the drug to be eliminated. Now you might not think this is that important, but it does have a lot to do with the dosing interval of the drug. Um, it also has a lot to do with uh, compounds like, um, I keep forgetting metabolite. What's nicotine's primary metabolite? Cotinin. So cotinin has a, I think it's about a 24 hour half life, mm -hmm. it's about a day. And that's what is measured. See so if somebody had a cigarette uh -huh. and in the urine. It's, it's really eliminated in the urine. So, um, with, so the 24 hour half life, of that metabolite, you have to not smoke or do anything like that for five days mm -hmm. uh, for it to be mostly eliminated. And so uh, one of the reasons why they use that as an insurance test is mm -hmm. you can a cup and then is there any cotinin in there? Um, and then you say, why in that cigarette? Four days, how did they find that? <laughs> gotcha. Um, so anyway, that's uh, another reason why the half-life is, uh, is important. Um, Total clearance is the, the renal clearance plus the liver hepatic clearance plus any other clearance that might be going on. Um, and I, it's just important to note that genetic polymorphisms um, do significant, can significantly influence the clearance uh, of a drug, the rate of metabolism uh, of a drug. And we, we found that with, um, uh, with, with several compounds uh, uh, over the years where different races of individual or if white in black or, or uh, Asian um, tend to have different groups have different um, polymorphisms that naturally occur in that population and it, those polymorphisms depending on where they are can affect uh, drug, uh, drug uh, metabolism. So all of this in the application to drug development is um, Preclinical uh, and clinical studies, they conduct a, a single ascending dose and multiple ascending dose studies um, using hopefully inadequate, uh, inadequate, not inadequate, uh -huh. uh, dose range, um, a minimum of, of, of three doses over at least a tenfold range of doses. I think 20 is, is probably a lot better. I've seen an example here where a uh, professor is doing uh, experiments with some compound in rats and said, you know, Ed, what do you think of these doses? And they're using placebo, so zero, 20 milligrams and 40 milligrams. Mm -hmm. To them, that was a big range. It's twofold. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not a very big range at all. Uh, you know, if you use two milligrams, 20 and 40, now you're talking. Mm -hmm. and, and so you need to dose it such that at the low end, you expect very little to no response, and at the high end, well, depending on the model that you're using, you know, could be quite toxic, and then and that's how you establish these relationships. Um, but again, this is uh, I think uh, how the kinetics turn. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I want to get to uh, a couple slides toward the end. Um, 
obviously from a sample collection perspective, it can be invasive or, or non-invasive. I should have put down here that hair would have been a, a good option here for some drugs. And most analytical methods are, are obviously designed for, uh, designed for plasma. Uh, we use, I guess, over the last well, quite a few years, <clears throat> the uh, analytical part has changed a lot from using HPLC or UPLC to mass spec. And uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages. I think for mass spec, clearly an advantage is sensitivity and selectivity, because you're actually looking at the mass of the compound and its daughter ions. And so you're, you're very selective and very sensitive. Um, we're, 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 one of ours is we're using, it's our Gantz cycle of um, We're using 10 microliters of plasma from a patient just 10 microliters, and we can get down to one nanogram per mil. So, especially with pediatric trials, it's very important. You can't suck 10 mils out of a little baby. Nobody's going to let you do that. And so we have to get, you know, we get 0.2 cc's of whole blood for a, a, a pharmacokinetic determination. And, uh, and that's what we have to work with. Either we find the drug in it or we don't. Unfortunately, they're also outrageously expensive. Um, for any of you who have them, know that they can run $250,000, $300,000, upwards of $500,000 uh, for a mass spec. Not to mention the maintenance contract that you have to have on that thing because it breaks down every other week. Um, and you have to pay for that as well. Uh, and you also need very well qualified, trained people uh, to run the instrumentation. And preferably people who also know how to fix it. <laughs> That's an advantage. So here's just a representative PK profile. Uh, clearly this is the, the concentration on the y-axis, time on the x. They go up to a peak. This is the absorption phase. That can be determined and modeled. The elimination phase where we get the half-life, and in this case, the trough concentration at 24 hours. And the AUC is just the full area uh, under that curve. And that, that area is, is generally what I like to look at in terms of, at first anyway, in terms of trying to establish concentration and response relationships, just because it's a good overall marker uh, of the drug. I'm not going to get into how we calculate the AUC. I'll just simply call it the trapezoidal rule. Um, but we add up the different areas under each time point that was collected and, and add them up, and, and that's your area. Some equations for you, um, in case you're interested. Uh, just very quickly, the differences between uh, what I briefly showed from the non-compartmental analysis versus modeling the data, where you actually apply a set of differential equations to the concentration time data. Um, so from the non-compartmental analysis, we can get all the primary, uh, secondary parameters that we need, area, curve, clearance, volume, half-life, et cetera. Um, modeling gets a little bit more. We can get those as well uh, from, from modeling the data. But most importantly is we can assess the covariate effects. And this is also this is very important for, uh, for pediatric uh, studies because we can look at is age, weight, serum creatinine, body surface area, whatever you want to pick, are those related to the clearance of the drug? Do they influence the clearance of the drug? Oftentimes the answer is yes. And so a lot of drugs are based on, uh, are dosed based on weight, like millig X milligrams per kilo, for example. And that's the reason why is because the, the kinetics are affected by the weight. We can describe the absorption characteristics. Most importantly, simulate concentrations to predict effects um, and dir directly link the PK with, uh, uh, with the response. Uh, this is simply a, an example of a one compartment model, what the concentration time curve looks like. As soon as the drug is infused, boom, it's all over the entire body instantaneously. This is a two compartment model where the drug first goes, uh, distributes to the tissues it wants to go to first before becoming uh, uh, equally distributed around the body. And the concentration time curve will be have two distinct phases, the distribution phase here and then the elimination phase here. And that's really how you can tell the difference between one and, and a two compartment model. I'm not going to spend time on this, but this is uh, uh, where this field has gone, uh, developing somewhat complex uh, uh, models, assessing the goodness of fit of, of the models and how, how well they fit the concentration time data. Uh, and then uh, importantly, I think, is, is conducting the simulations. So once you have the model and the fit, 
you can give the computer any dose you want, right? Mm -hmm. And it's going to generate the concentrations that will be produced. And that, I think, is a very, very good, um, uh, uh, very helpful uh, thing to do. And then lastly, I'll just wrap up with these uh, couple of slides. Um, so this is a, a dose binding study for one of the drugs we've worked with, Dalutegavir, where they looked at 2 milligrams, blue line, 10 and 50 milligrams. So how big is that spread? 25, right? So nice number. Three doses is all they use, but a 25, uh, 25x spread. And, um, and that's what you see is a very good differential in the response. But when you put that together, so this is the concentration time curve here on the left. Um, over here is the concentration response. And so this is the change in the amount of virus from baseline through day 10 of treatment. And up, this is the x-axis is simply the trough concentration, or in this case, the C24. They found this very, very nice maximum effect relationship. What does this tell us? <clears throat> this dashed line right here is, is, a, uh, is about the, the EC90 concentration required to produce 90% of the maximum effect. That is our target. That's the number we do not want this trough to go below. And so now we know, because of this one study that they did, what that should be. So if somebody talks to me about drug interactions, say, well, as long as the trough is above you know, 250 or whatever that number is, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, bringing the drug into a pediatric population, um, hugely beneficial. Because we don't know how to dose the drug in a baby. But we can give them a dose that we think might be okay and measure the concentrations and adjust it immediately to get where we want to go. And so that's why I think this is so important to have a wide dose ranging uh, evaluation. Go and no go decisions for early phase development. I mean, if you've got a drug that produces concentrations up in this range, but significant toxicities occur right here, pretty much the drug is over. And, and just move forward, get rid of it, move forward with the next compound in the pipeline so it can save a, a great deal of money. So just to wrap up, uh, understanding the basic principles of pharmacokinetics, I think, can uh, clearly assist in the drug discovery and development process. It's critical that proper collection of the data uh, is done, especially in animal studies early on. Uh, it does provide useful insight into the uh, uh, kinetics in, in humans, and uh, establishing a concentration response relationships is critical, uh, I think, for proper uh, dose selection. And this is not just humans, but I think in animal models as well. In animal models, you got a heck of a lot more leeway. We can't give really, really high doses and really, really low doses to people, especially not babies, uh, all the time. So the time to really look at these is probably more during the animal model uh, development stage. So I will stop there, and hopefully we have a few minutes for some questions. Thank you. And before I forget, if you haven't signed in when you came in, do us a favor and sign your name legibly. It's really handwriting. Uh, because we need that to get my birthday and stuff like that. All right, so questions. So, so like if you have a um, I think that I want to know all the studies. First, you want you to work with a medicinal cabinet to increase potency, reducing toxicity, right? And it would be pretty good at, you know, uh, potency and also you know, reasonable toxicity. Then you move, move to the PD, PK to start increasing and Yeah, and hopefully you'd have more than one option. So even if, uh, as much as we need, and we do need medicinal chemists a lot, which we have more here at UAB, uh, as well as formulation experts. Um, but even they aren't going to be able to necessarily say, all right, we tweak this molecule this way, you're going to avoid this toxicity. And, I mean, you never know what's going to happen, so it has to be looked at. So to have a small battery of different compounds that are tweaked, I think would be a, a really good way to start. And that if you start looking at cell lines or animal models and see that, Okay, these three really don't look good. They have really fast half-lives or whatever. They focus on the other ones. Yeah, so what we've done in the ADA programs is once we've um, tweaked the compound enough that at least it has acceptable pharmacokinetics, mm -hmm. a half-life of at least maybe an hour or two, 
And then as a half hour with three minutes, we're not going to do a mouse experiment because it will be a waste of everybody's time. So those parameters can shift a little bit depending on the model, but we do always look at pharmacokinetics first before we initiate the efficacy study, um, just because you want to know you have exposure. And if you're dealing with uh, a compound that a lot of drugs you can't put into an IV solution or <clears throat> formulation, so you're giving some a liquid or crushed tablet, whatever it might be, orally, gavage, whatever it might be, there may be significant absorption issues in that model or in general. And so looking at the PK early on, really early on, sort of tell, you know, okay, this thing is really not looking good. I don't want to waste my time. I'm not going to write a grant on this. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so what you're trying to say is that even before you find you know, very good, like a, you know, like a compound which is a very high potency, you very lose that. You always better to, you know, work with them, like, you know, like you, people like you to, you know, make sure, you know, uh, you know, I think this compound also have a good P, uh, PKPD so far. Yeah, at least reasonable. It doesn't have to be good. <laughs> I, you know, an hour I think is a kind of a benchmark to, yeah. to go by. But um, but yeah, I mean, does it get into the, if you're, I'm, I'm talking more animals here at this point, but does it get into their system? Can you measure it? At some point you're going to, if you're developing a drug or a chemical, whatever, you're going to have to measure it. Yeah. And so Either you develop an assay um, in your own lab, your own folks, um, which is perfectly fine, or you know, other like my group we, we does that as well. And so, um, but at some point, I see this way too often. Somebody doesn't even have an assay for this compound that they've developed, and uh, they really need to work. Which is why medicinal chemists are so important here. Would be important is is to work with them to synthesize the compound a pure version of it, as well as some type of finding an internal standards. We need an internal standard on the mass spec anyway to be able to quantitate that compound. And so um, a newly developed chemical entity, I can't call up the Toronto Research and say, hey, you know, we got a stable isotope version of this. What are you talking about? And uh, and so those are what those are what we need. And so but whether it's ELISA or whatever assay method, there needs to be a way to develop an assay to quantitate what you're trying to do. And then put that information in the grant when it's going in. It has to go in there. They always come back, where's the PK? Yeah. And then I get the phone call, I'm like, oh, okay, let's, let's work on this. Let's do it the rest.